Okay, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to the next talk of IWQC20. Our next speaker is Matthew Amy, and he's going to be talking about phase state duality. Uh, Matthew, take it away. All right, uh, thanks for the introduction, Ross. Uh, so yeah, today I'm going to be talking about some work in progress that I've been doing with Neil J. Ross here at Dalhousie in Canada, uh, specifically about uh, reversible circuit compilation. And what we're kind of trying to do is, is generalize and kind of codify some of these techniques that have been used in a lot of these recent uh, uh, reversible circuit designs, basically. Uh, these techniques, which we kind of colloquially refer to as the phase state duality techniques. Uh, and specifically, you know, over the past uh, about 10 years, we've kind of found a lot of these very specialized kind of implementations of various, uh, you know, kind of reversible functions and circuits. Uh, and they all kind of use this, this kind of idea of both the Z basis and the X basis. Uh, they use this, this extra degree of freedom that we have in quantum computing for constructing these reversible circuits. Uh, and they manage to reduce, uh, say, the T count or the depth or the number of uh, you know, ancillas to produce uh, reversible circuits. Uh, and these are brilliant constructions, but I'm not a fan of this because I don't like special constructions. I like to have things automated. And I like to, you know, in kind of a declarative programming style, just be able to tell a compiler what I want it to compile and then for it to kind of synthesize exactly, you know, an optimal circuit. So I don't like having to use special constructions uh, like some of these, these uh, uh, circuits that I've listed here. Uh, so that's really kind of the impetus uh, for this work. So our goal was to kind of look at these constructions and try to uh, unify them, you know, kind of within a framework of reusable and automatable design techniques uh, rather than just having these specialized constructions. Uh, and the reality is, you know, this is a work in progress. We're not quite all the way there yet. Uh, but obviously, you know, I'm speaking, I must have something to talk about. Uh, and fortunately, we do have some applications of this kind of analysis that we've been doing of these circuits. Uh, in particular, we have a number of novel constructions that reduce the T count uh, for some, you know, specific kinds of uh, functions, and these are generally useful in the low space regime. So when we're kind of space constrained uh, for synthesizing our reversible circuits. And I should also mention that we're specifically looking at Clifford plus T implementations uh, with this work. All right, so uh, what I'm going to do for this talk is kind of just go over uh, some of these, some of these constructions and kind of the design process that went into them. Uh, so that maybe there's, you know, kind of a kernel of logic that someone can extract. Uh, Cause otherwise, you know, we could just list the constructions on a slide and the talk would be over. Uh, I guess that would be good for timing, but yeah. So uh, the first kind of construction that I'm going to go over uh, is this idea of using dirty ancillas in reversible circuit design and how we can kind of use the phase state duality to optimize some of these dirty ancilla constructions. Uh, so the general premise that we're working with in this uh, kind of talk is that we want to implement say a classical Oracle, a Boolean function that has K inputs and one output. Uh, and we would, typically, you know, in quantum computing, obviously want to implement this as a reversible map uh, by adding it into a target bit. And we know that we can't always do this without ancillas. So the typical solution is to uh, compute temporary values into ancillas, uh, use these temporary values to kind of compute the function f uh, into the target, and then later on compute so that we don't have this, this state garbage lying around. Uh, so just as a concrete example, suppose we have uh, this function on six bits that just computes it, uh, an exclusive OR, a Boolean OR of these two degree five terms. Uh, and you know, one of the things that we can do if we want to implement this, we can see that we can actually factor out 
uh, product of x1, x2, x3, x4 uh, from both these terms. And the resulting circuit looks kind of something like this. Say we uh, you know, first compute this product of four bits into an ancilla, and then we can just uh, compute the function f by doing an extra CNOC gate and then a Toffley gate, and then just uncompute everything. And this obviously isn't the best uh, implementation by any stretch, but it's one possible implementation that we might want to use. Uh, and now the next thing that we need to do is we need to decompose, if we want a Clifford plus T circuit, uh, this four control Toffley gate over Clifford plus T. And uh, typically what we would do, you know, we would pull up the Branko et al. paper from 1995 that has uh, a four control Toffley gate using two dirty ancillas. Uh, and this takes eight Toffley gates. Uh, and then maybe we would put this into PISX or something to optimize the number of T gates. We would get something like, uh, say, 30 T gates after optimization, I think. It's probably about 30. Uh, or we can you know, go further by opening up this Dmitry Maslow paper from 2016 and uh, seeing that we have a T count 24 implementation. And uh, this, this implementation actually from this Dmitry Maslow paper reduces the ancilla count, in this case, down to just one ancilla, uh, or in general, K minus two over two for K controls. Uh, but still, we might wonder, can we do even better than this, right? And now, one of the first things that we can note, right, is that uh, we don't actually need to implement this, this Toffley exactly. We can use this extra degree of freedom, which is the phase space, because that's orthogonal to the state space. Uh, and it'll just end up commuting through after we uncompute this G. And if we uncompute G by just doing the inverse of G, uh, this will cancel, you know, with this D dagger gate that we have at the end. Uh, so this is what would normally be called a kind of a relative phase implementation of uh, this, this temporary function G. And we can kind of always play this game uh, when we're doing this kind of compute uncompute uh, type thing. So the problem is that it's not always clear how to exactly design something in a smart way up to this relative phase. Uh, so that's kind of what I'm going to be talking about a lot through this talk. Uh, and one of the techniques that we kind of have at our disposal is the fact that conjugation by Hadamard gates kind of swaps the state and phase. So for example, if we have a circuit that uh, computes, you know, this phase negative one, to the y times g of x1 through xn, uh, we can just conjugate this with Hadamard's uh, on this target y to instead put the computation into the state space. Uh, so now we have a y x or g x1 through xn. And uh, <clears throat> what we can actually see is that uh, we can kind of use this in the opposite direction too in the sense that if we have state garbage uh, that we would normally want to uncompute, we can actually push this into phase garbage, into a relative phase. Uh, in particular, for the, uh, for the Barenko style four control Toffley gate, you know, if we look at the first five Toffley gates uh, of this implementation, we see that we've actually computed exactly the function that we want to compute. Uh, and the other three Toffley gates are just kind of uncomputing the state garbage. Well, instead of using these Toffley gates, what we can actually just do is conjugate these dirty ancillas uh, with Hadamard gates to swap the state garbage into the phase space where it'll just commute through the computation. Uh, and now we've returned the ancillas to their initial state as desired. So this gives a, a slight improvement. Uh, it saves, you know, after we do optimization for T gates, uh, and it saves four T gates for kind of any K. Uh, so it's, it's just a constant improvement. It's not great. But what is kind of interesting about this, this uh, construction is that it actually matches the usual construction where we would use clean ancillas. So it has the exact same resource counts as the clean ancilla construction. And it's in fact identical. Uh, so if these ancillas are actually in the zero state, 
we don't end up with a relative phase. So now we can just use the same circuit for clean and dirty ancillas, uh, which I think is kind of neat. But we might wonder, can we do even better? Um, and to do better, we kind of have to go back to the drawing board uh, and think about how we might synthesize this directly up to phase. Uh, and one of the ways that we can do this is kind of look at synthesizing in the phase instead of in the state in the first place, because uh, this kind of simplifies things in some way. So in this case, we see that we only really need to do this, this phase of negative one to the y times x1 through x4. Uh, and we can have this, this kind of extra phase uh, that doesn't you know, refer to y. And then we can just swap this into the state space to get our correct uh, state up to relative phase. And this seems like it's just kind of kicking the can down the road, uh, but it makes it kind of conceptually simpler sometimes and, and makes it clearer to see some other possible implementations. And in this case, uh, you know, we can see that basically all we need to do is repeatedly multiply the target y with each of the inputs x4 through x1. Uh, and we can actually reuse those inputs once they've already been multiplied in to store temporary values. So here we've multiplied uh, y by x4 and stored it in a dirty ancilla, uh, this a. And now we multiply it by x3 and store it back in x4, right? And we see that we only have one term that you know, references y, which is exactly what we want. And now we can just kind of kick this into the phase with a doubly controlled Z gate, uh, which gives exactly a phase of the form that we were looking for in the first place. So this is kind of the, the first construction uh, that I'm going to introduce today, which is uh, a multiply controlled Toffley gate up to relative phase that uses a single dirty ancilla. Uh, and has tcamp20 or 8k minus 1 minus 4 for k controls. Uh, and again, the important thing is that it uses only one ancilla, which is kind of neat. So we don't really, as long as we don't care about relative phase, we don't really need to use the separate single ancilla uh, Barranco style construction anymore. OK. So now I'm just going to go into some other ancilla free constructions. Uh, so specifically, now we want to look at constructions that don't use ancillas at all. Uh, and what we can do for this is kind of go back to uh, Peter Salinger's CCIX gate, uh, this doubly controlled IX gate from 2013. Uh, and if you haven't seen it, it's this circuit here that just computes a Toffley up to a phase of I and the controls. And uh, I won't go into the details of how this actually works, but uh, one thing that we can actually do, we can generalize this uh, into just a form of balanced Boolean uh, multiplication using four T gates and two applications of F and G each, right? And this will you know, compute the product of F and G up to a phase of I, F, G. Uh, but then, you know, in 2016, there was this kind of this really interesting uh, four qubit Toffley gate that Dmitry Maslov came up with uh, that looks kind of superficially different uh, at first. Uh, it uses eight T gates. Uh, and basically, the way it does this, it uses, uses this uh, balanced kind of multiplication, but then it gets rid of this, this extra G because all that's doing is uncomputing. Uh, the state, but we're conjugating with Hadamard's. So that'll just become phase garbage anyway. So he leaves out the second Toffley. And now we've got, uh, you know, three control Toffley up to a phase, uh, you know, a, a doubly controlled Z gate on the target here. And again, we can generalize this into an unbalanced multiplication construction where we have four T gates, uh, two applications of F, one application of G at the expense uh, compared to the balanced multiplication of a phase of G dependent on the target. 
And this is really important uh, because that means we can't, we can't kind of just keep iterating this construction without adding terms into the phase. Uh, I mean, that's, that's what we were hoping at first, but it turns out not to work that way, uh, you know, because we have this, this target dependent phase that adds back into the state if we keep iterating the construction. Uh, but we kind of came up with this, this construction that we think is interesting anyway, uh, just because it allows us to generate a degree K uh, oracle, you know, with four K minus one T gates. Uh, and the best known previously would just be a K control Toffley gate without ancillas, which would take uh, 16 K minus one T gates, right? And uh, it's also interesting because you can actually get distinct uh, classes of functions that are Clifford equivalent, uh, which gives kind of applications to this uh, lookup table based reversible circuit synthesis. Uh, so we found a couple instances where it actually improves over the state of the art uh, for specific classes of functions. Uh, so that's kind of neat. But of course, we really wanted to get uh, an ancilla free multiply controlled Toffley gate, or at least uh, reduce the number of T gates for an ancilla free multiply controlled Toffley gate. Uh, so our first thought was that we can, you know, kind of interleave this balanced and unbalanced multiplication. Uh, and we kind of, we kind of, codified this as a uh, multiply controlled X bullet gate, which has, you know, a phase dependent on just the controls and a multiply controlled X star gate, which uh, has a phase also dependent on the target, right? And basically the idea here is that whenever we have a compute uncompute pair, we can use this X star uh, because the phase dependent on the target gets kind of canceled out. Uh, and whenever we only have one, you know, we use an X bullet. Uh, and this outperforms the state of the art for up to about 10 controls, but then starts kind of underperforming because it actually scales non-linearly. Um, so that was kind of disappointing. But then we went back to the drawing board, of course, uh, and, you know, used this extra degree of freedom with the dirty ancillas. Uh, and came up with a dirty ancilla uh, multiply control Toffley gate, which uh, I already showed. And then that reduces the T count down to eight K minus two uh, for K controls. And that's compared to the state of the art of 16 K minus two plus four. And uh, it also improves the T count for, uh, you know, when you have the regime when you have less than k minus two over two clean ancillas. Let's see, I still have a minute or two. So I'm just going to uh, talk about one more kind of type of construction real quickly, which is a measurement assisted uncomputation circuits. Uh, and the impetus for this was really kind of this, this Cody Jones Toffley from 2013. Uh, where he had discovered that you can implement the Toffley gate exactly uh, using four T gates, a measurement, and a classically controlled Clifford. Uh, and the way he does this, he first computes the product of two bits into an ancilla, applies phase correction, then copies it out and uncomputes it by switching into the phase space where you know you can kind of commute this measurement through one of the controls to make it a classical control. And uh, this kind of didn't really, didn't really become super popular as far as I know, uh, just because, you know, any case where we actually needed a Toffley, the doubly controlled IX gate would suffice pretty much anyway. Um, but then Craig Gidney came along in 2018 uh, and he kind of pulled apart the circuit into two constructions. He saw that, you know, you can actually just take the compute construction uh, that costs four T gates and take the uncompute construction that uh, doesn't cost any T gates and uh, kind of use them separately uh, so that you can kind of initialize this product, use it for a while. You know, it can be a, a big circuit in the center that you use it for. Uh, and then later uncompute this product. Uh, so that gives four T gates uh, per, 
you know, pair that you want to multiply. And you can play this game uh, adding more controls, right? Uh, computing a, a logical AND of k bits. And if you play this game, you see that what happens uh, when you apply the, uh, the Hadamard gate in the measurement, uh, you actually don't have a Clifford correction anymore. You have a multiply controlled Z gate that you need to correct. Uh, so this doesn't seem so great, but in practice, you can still get some savings by doing this kind of measurement assisted uncomputation, especially if you computed the product up to phase in the first place, because now you have this, this D dagger gate that you can get some phase cancellations with the multiply controlled Z gate. So we kind of played this game for a couple uh, uh, small numbers of controls and we found some savings. Uh, in particular, we can uncompute a logical AND of three bits using 3.5 T gates on average uh, with a circuit like this. Uh, and that's compared to eight T gates to compute the product in the first place or uncompute it directly. Uh, and then similar for four controls, uh, you know, you can bring the T count down to 7.5 on average. And we have a circuit for five controls too, but it's kind of, it's kind of a pain. I didn't want to type it out. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. All right, so uh, that basically concludes everything I wanted to talk about. Uh, and basically we gave a bunch of constructions here, but the main takeaway is really that, you know, improvements can be made by designing with both phase and state space in mind. Uh, and then of course, uh, for the future, we need to kind of finish this work in progress in sense, uh, which mostly involves, uh, you know, coming up with a general un-k and uh, with measurement and also kind of automating this entire process, uh, which was the goal in the first place. So uh, just references. All right, thanks. Uh, thank you, Matthew. That very nice talk. Um, I see lots of like excited GIFs in Slack, but not, uh, not much in the way of questions at the moment. So <laughs> give a couple of moments for people to catch up. Uh, All right. But in the meantime, let me ask you a, a kind of rubbish question, which is that uh, in the, the work that, that I'm mostly involved in, we're not thinking about T counts so much, but getting non-Clifford gates out of the circuit is still a very valuable thing to do from the point of view of circuit optimizing. Yeah. So I was wondering if you saw any way to, to apply any of these kind of techniques outside of this reversible Clifford plus T framework and look at it. Um, T gate removal in, for example, exponentiated poly circuits. Yeah, so that's something that I haven't really looked too much into uh, the exponentiated poly circuits. Uh, I mean, then, yeah, <clears throat> yeah, because in, in general, I mean, you don't really have to do too much uh, kind of reversible computation, right? It's all just kind of uh, changing the basis uh, and then applying some sort of rotations, right? Um, so I'm not sure how useful these types of techniques would be for that. Um, okay, well, I will, I will yeah, yeah. pass on to a question which is a bit more uh, relevant to your talk, though maybe not a lot more relevant. From, I mean, yeah, that, was, that was relevant too. <laughs> and Clara Gojoso would like to know, did you try looking at this inside the ZX calculus because the the color duality of the calculus is exactly the state phase duality that you're working with here. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think the thing is with all of these, with all these things, you can look at them in, in a lot of different ways, right? And I, I prefer to just kind of look at things, not so much in the ZX calculus, but this more kind of phase polynomial view. And uh, that's really how we've been looking at these circuits and designing them. We have, uh, I was actually going to do a demo of uh, some of the tools that I use to help kind of design these circuits, uh, which use this, this kind of phase polynomial type view instead, and has, you know, a, a similar flavor in a lot of ways. And it's possible that, you know, looking at it in the ZX calculus, uh, some things might become more obvious, uh, definitely, but 
Yeah, I haven't specifically uh, just because, you know, we have kind of our own set of tools, or at least I have my own set of tools that I, I like to use for, for working with the phase and state space. Uh, okay, well, I will, in the interest of um, not letting our schedule go completely off the rails, I'll just take one more question uh, from Ralph Johansson, which is asking, what is the current status of the, uh, the automation of this stuff? <laughs> uh, so the current status of the automation, um, it, there isn't really much, uh, if I'm honest, in the way of automation. Uh, uh, basically, so so the way the way we kind of design these circuits is uh, by using some software to kind of actually compute. Uh, you know, we we just have a Clifford plus T circuit. Uh, and we'll use this software to kind of reduce it and compute the actual phase terms that we get. Uh, and the big problem right now is really kind of figuring out how to uncompute these, these complicated phase terms. Uh, so I guess basically the, the state that we're at as far as automation goes, we're, we're able to figure out exactly what this residual phase term is. Um, you know, which in some cases is very complicated actually with, with uh, tons and tons of terms. Uh, but then we're not, uh, we, we're not at the point yet where we can automate the process of kind of uncomputing uh, these relative phases. Uh, great. Okay. Well, thanks very much for the talk, Matthew. That was very interesting. Um, I think there are people still typing in the Slack channel. But I'm I'm going to cut it off here. But please go and uh, go and meet your your uh, psychedelic uh, fans in the uh, in the Slack.